guys, and welcome back to Design Theory, the fourth unknown theorist channel that MatPat does not know about nor endorse. This is also the second video in my Tears of the Kingdom changes to the main races series. If you haven't seen it yet, check out the last one I made where I cover how the Gorons will essentially become malice zombies. This video took a lot longer than my previous one since I decided to go a little crazy and create several concept drawings in addition to a final piece that incorporated everything. I may have gone a little overboard though, but hey, since the Game Awards didn't bring any new substance, Splatter Colors is here to give you my bootleg artwork and theories. So if you really enjoy it or any of my other videos, please like, comment, and subscribe. In Breath of the Wild, we are introduced to the Yiga clan, an offshoot of the Sheikah tribe who split from their kind after Sheikah technology was outlawed. This caused them to side with Ganon and form an order that took over one of the Gerudu temples as their headquarters. Even after defeating their leader, Master Koga, and receiving the Thunderhelm, Link continues to be pestered and attacked by these guys throughout his journey. One theory is that the Gerudu will betray Hyrule and side with Ganon now that he's back. Indeed, the Gerudu do have a long history of being ruled by the singular male child born to their race every hundred years. Given that the Gerudo people that we know from Breath of the Wild haven't seen an heir since Four Swords Adventures or The Adventure of Link, depending on which line of this hey! show of a timeline you decide to follow, which, according to the in-game lore, there has been at least 10,000 years since any Zelda game and Breath of the Wild. Even if a male Gerudo had continued to have been born during this time, it's not unlikely that the Gerudo's government and loyalty could have changed in such a long time span. Urbosa even makes her resentment very clear during a cutscene we get after defeating Thunderblight. And that will make this victory all the more satisfying. On top of all that, the Yiga are pretty established enemies of the Gerudo. I'm sure that if they were going to be allies, a treaty would have been established when Calamity Ganon came out of the woodwork a hundred years ago. I certainly believe it's much more likely that these two groups will continue to be at odds and Tears of the Kingdom will up the stakes more than ever. Yes, Nintendo could just declare that the Yiga and Gerudo are now fighting and there are no changes to the environment or character designs. But that would be boring. This is a new game after all, not the Champions Ballad DLC Part 3. They've had many years to develop something fresh and I'd be shocked if they aren't shaking it up. We are getting there after sh** hey! hits the fan. The Gerudo have already lost. In one of the Tears of the Kingdom trailers we've gotten, we see Link, presumably waking up with his new glowing hand on some kind of pedestal. This will likely be our reset point for Link, with some time passing again. Hopefully not a hundred years this time. Just enough time, though, for Ganon to make his escape, gather his army, and start wreaking havoc upon Hyrule again. My main theory for this episode is that Ganon's return will empower his loyal Yiga servants, as well as his malice monsters, enough so that Gerudo Town will be taken over and the Gerudo people forced to flee. The return of Ganon, not long after he was supposedly beaten by the chosen hero, will cast doubt and fear in the hearts of Hyrule citizens. If you feel like you are on the losing side of history, what do you do? Fight them, run, or join them? Hyrule's people, seeing a hundred years of repressed societal collapse, a lack of established monarchs, and losing hope in their chosen hero, might be inclined to join the perceived winning side. It's for those reasons the Yiga clan will see a sudden and rapid rise in recruits. More soldiers means more money, skills, and supplies, making the Yiga stronger than ever. Since the Yiga will be adding new weapons, warrior types, and be able to take over Gerudo Town because of it. Let's go ahead and jump into the first design change of our Yiga members. The the Yiga Foot Soldier. Their outfits are fairly simple, skin-tight layered jumpsuits. At closer glance, we can see the design is very similar to the sneaking outfit you can buy in Kakariko Village. The sneaking outfit's description quotes, utilizing soundproofing technology. Now, this could be referencing some crazy ancient Sheikah microchip fabric that we have no frame of reference of, but what we do have knowledge of in the real world is fabrics that aid in soundproofing. These fabrics are often thicker, less breathable fabrics, and are often classified as warmer winter clothes. The Yiga clan hideout was bordering the edge of the Gerudo Highlands and the Gerudo Desert in the Karusa Valley, which tends to be a bit cooler than the areas around Gerudo Town. As you can see in my drawing, it's for this reason we're going to remove some of the warmer layers in their outfit, 
The gray undertights will be removed, exposing their arms and legs, but keeping their bracers and main deep red jumpsuit. I also want to do more to protect our little antagonist minions from the heat in the Gerudo Desert by giving them more of a hood around their heads. This is a common fashion choice in our world for countries with lots of sun. Moving on to the weapons, I want to replace the sickle with a completely new way to fight the Yiga foot soldiers. Nunchucks would be a great way of spicing up fighting against the Yiga, and we even know Nintendo experimented with similar weapon physics styles when designing for Breath of the Wild. If we turn to creating a champion, page 83, we can see some character and weapon designs for the different races. The Kokiri seem to be holding a whip, and the Shika a hookshot, whose rope physics would be similar to those of nunchucks. I personally would hunt down every Higa foot soldier if it meant I could make nunchucks my go-to weapon in Tears of the Kingdom. I tried to keep the handle as close to the Yiga's other weapon handles as I could, stealing elements from the Vicious Sickle and Duplex Bow. Then it's as simple as adding a few chains and connecting the two. I also believe the nunchucks could be upgraded as the storyline progresses. Much like in Breath of the Wild, once you defeat Master Koga, the Yiga Foot Soldier's sickle is upgraded for the Demon Carver. I'd love to keep that theme going and have the nunchucks be upgraded to the Kusari Gama after you rid the Yiga from Gerudo Town. For our upgraded weapon, we're carrying over most of the elements from the regular nunchucks, but adding not one, not two, but three blades. Because more spiky blades make everything cooler. <laughs> nah, but actually, we're sticking to the Yiga clan's motif of threes and taking inspiration from the spikes on their forearms and shins. The Yiga clan have heavy Japanese influence in their culture and design, so nunchucks and kusari gama are a great way of changing up their weapons while staying in line with their original source material. The foot soldiers will also still carry their trusty bows, but I don't imagine their designs will change too much past the point of recognition. On to the Blade Masters. We're going to give them a similar treatment to the foot soldiers and take away their gray tights. I'm going to switch their harness and belt shapes and make the harness an X shape across the chest with a simple belt on their hip. The original Blade Master from Breath of the Wild has a hood, much like the new one we gave the foot soldier in our design. So we'll keep that from their original design, but also cover up their ponytails. The Blade Masters have many references to samurai culture, from the sound effects, the design, and their symbols. I would like to add another nod to the samurai through the form of Kuwagata, the little appendages extending off of their helmets. We see three of these appendages on Master Koga's mask, which could indicate his rank and superiority. Ah! Distinguishing these blade masters from the foot soldiers, besides in just stature alone, would be a welcomed addition. Keeping with the samurai theme, I'd like to add Fuki Kiyashi, which are the little winglets that flare out at the sides. The weapon is where I'd like to switch up the styles some more. Their class name is based on the blade weapon choice, the wind cleaver, so I'm certainly not going to deviate far from their blade namesakes. I'm suggesting we make them dual blade masters. Their weapon from Breath of the Wild is already based on the katana. Because of this, we'll be designing a short sword called a wakazashi. This pair, otherwise called a daisho, will complement each other's design. The wind cleaver has a wavy edge that will be continued in our short sword, but we will be mirroring the shape so that when combined, they complete one another. Fighting dual swordsmen is a familiar enemy style in the Zelda series. Think of the Bokoblins and Stalfos from Skyward Sword. And in the same vein as my burning desire to have Link swing nunchucks around, I want to ditch the shield and run full force at a group of Moblins with a sword in either hand. This could work as a second equipped, or it could be considered a shield in the inventory slot. In one of the few teasers we've gotten so far, we can see Link attacking with some sort of carved shield, a giant flame coming out of the mouth of the dragon and attacking the enemy. This makes me believe that there will be much more dynamic and interesting shields in Tears of the Kingdom. So a short sword that can block an attack is not so far-fetched anymore. Now, this next design will be an entirely new class of Yiga soldiers, and it's probably the theory I'm most excited about in this whole video. But first, I just want to take a second and say thanks so much for watching this theory. I still have a lot more to talk about, so definitely consider subscribing. My goal is to hit 1k subs on this channel for 2023, so if you want to join in, I'd be happy to have you. Now back to the video. A great new addition could be a grenadier. Now this is definitely a weapon we didn't fight against in Breath of the Wild. We did, on the other hand, have our Sheikah Slate Bombs, which I know some of our more combat adverse players utilize quite heavily. 
We'll come back to the bombs as a weapon in a bit, but for now let's discuss the rest of the design. The Yiga Grenadier will have a similar build to the Foot Soldier, but with some class of explosive expert elements mixed in. Now, when I think of a Grenadier in traditional media, I think of three things. Crazy hair, straps of bombs around their chest, and some huge goggles. So that's exactly what we're going to do. It's important in game design to distinguish certain enemy elements to indicate to the player, hey, this enemy is different and it's going to be throwing bombs at you from afar, so don't get close. There's a couple ways we're going to distinguish their look. We're going to change the long arm guards the foot soldiers have for a short fingerless glove. Exposing more skin and removing the signature spiky arms is a change you can see from far away. It also helps to alter the silhouette. We will be replacing the hooded style for these three spiky ponytails, almost like a divided mohawk. This is also why I chose to cover up both the Foot Soldier and Blade Master ponytails in our previous designs. We will also be adding an X-shaped straps, which will carry their bombs, against their whole torso, changing their shape design significantly. I want to add in these large circular goggles, which will also add uniqueness and shape to their silhouette. Now, I felt a bit silly adding these because the Yiga don't really have eyes, just a giant mask. But hey, if they're somehow able to see through a solid mask, I don't think they'll mind the extra goggle precaution. The bombs will be similar to the Sheikah Slate bombs, as the Yiga have been stealing most of their weapons and designs from their former comrades anyway. We're going with the round bomb design, but adding in some of the classic Yiga elements, such as the large silver loop, that's on most of their weapon handles, the sharp pointy designs that I put into the etchings, and the red torn fabric that makes an appearance on most of their weaponry. I wanted to replace the ancient technology in the Sheikah bombs with something more fitting. Ganon's back, and with that, more malice. They've got so much of it, it's just spewing out of Elden Volcano. In Breath of the Wilds, we see the Yiga experimenting with smoke bombs. When fighting the Yiga, they throw down what seems to be smoke bombs to teleport, transform, and disappear. My idea is that they are stepping it up a notch, using their knowledge of bombs, and harnessing the malice around them. When these bombs explode, not only will they cause damage, but maybe even a malice sludge could cover the player, causing damage over time and slowing Link. As we are most likely losing the Sheikah Slate and all its cool gadgets in Tears of the Kingdom, we're going to need something to replace the bombs. Maybe you'll bind them, like we did with different arrow types in Breath of the Wild. There could be Malice Bombs, Shock Bombs, Ice Bombs, and Fire Bombs. Well, I guess that's just a regular bomb, but regardless, this could be one of the many ways we could farm bombs off enemies. Finishing off our design, we're going to attach these Malice Bombs to our Grenadier and complete their look. Let's move on to our next design theory. We've already seen from the trailers a platform talus with a structure built around their bodies and other enemies stationed on top. This is a great way to reimagine the talus. Assuming that Tears of the Kingdom is taking place not long after Breath of the Wild, it's not like the original overworld bosses are going to disappear. Adding on some platforms and throwing some of the enemies on them reinvents them just enough so that it feels new to fight. I want to do the same thing, but with the Mulduga. I loved fighting the Mulduga in Breath of the Wild, but it wasn't very high stakes. You could mostly throw bombs, stand still, and then run up and hit their bellies a few times. So let's make it a bit more interesting. Rather than the wooden platforms on the talus, we're going to use the metal we see the Yika clan uses. One place we can pull from is the giant metal ball Koga wields during your boss battle. Koga can bend this metal to his will, so other Yika members could have the ability to form this metal to Mulduga. Since part of my theory is that the Yiga will seize Gerudo Town, this armored Mulduga will be the driving factor in how the Yiga begin and accomplish this seize. I know what you're thinking, but Splat, how would the Yiga control this giant blind beast? Bombs? Malice bombs, that is. The Mulduga will react to the slightest sound in the sand, making it too difficult to control them organically. But bombs make up some of the biggest reverberations in the game, which will help the Mulduga be focused where you direct them. Grenadier class of Yiga will play a big part in the Mulduga's success. Because of this reason, the Grenadier will also be part of the armored Mulduga's platforms. You can't really build off the Mulduga like the Talus though, since they, you know, completely bury themselves underground. So I would like to extend a chain off of their new armor and up to a metal platform that will float above the surface where the Mulduga is submerged. 
The Grenadier will control the actions from up here, as well as attacking the player with bombs. The best part about this is it will force the player to keep moving. You can no longer stay still, throwing bombs and waiting, but instead have to navigate a giant sensory beast and some bomb-throwing hooligans. I imagine you would encounter these armored Mulduga throughout the desert, patrolling in certain areas for the Yiga being the best guard dog possible. These encounters would be much more thrilling than Breath of the Wild, with the player having to take out all the Grenadiers first in order to take down the Sandy Goliath. This finishes up the Yika weapons, monsters, and costume designs. So let's get into the designs of the Gerudo soldiers and citizens. Throughout the Zelda series, the Gerudo conception has been a stereotypical look at Middle Eastern societies. They take inspiration from Egyptian, Ottoman, Persian, Arabic, and Hindu peoples through a Western lens. Nintendo has officially stated their design is based off the Amazon female warrior race, which in cultural values definitely makes sense. But in their town design, clothing, fabric, and patterns, it's obvious they took a lot of real-world inspiration. Take the Bedla, for example. It's probably the closest thing to what the Gerudo wear in Breath of the Wild. Bedla is Arabic for suit, even though its origins isn't actually Arabic. The Bedla was created for European Western audiences and was advertised as the exotic garb belly dancers wore. Knowing the Arabic roots for their designs, we can start to create our Gerudo warriors' upgraded wartime garb. I'll be pulling from various wartime armor and fashion, as well as making some design and story decisions. One motif we already see in Breath of the Wild Gerudo's look is the symbolism of the Desert Rose. This is all over their clothing, armor, architecture, and weapons, but I really want to emphasize it on our new warriors here. In ancient Egypt, fly amulets were given to their most persistent warriors. Those who wore the fly were awarded such because they stung their enemies. I could definitely see the Desert Rose being used in a similar way. The Gerudo admire their rose due to its resilience in the sun's gaze. Now that the war against the Yiga will be more ferocious than ever, awarding everyone who decides to join the Gerudo war front will be given garb heavily clad in Desert Rose symbolism. Starting with their headgear, well, there is little to begin with, but as I said, we're in the thick of war and I'd like our Gerudo warriors to keep their brains in their skulls. I'll be pulling inspiration from the Turkish helmet and the Thunder Helm from Breath of the Wild. We'll be utilizing this cone-like shape that extends upwards. I would like to take further inspiration from the Turks and include a Damascus technique to the helmet. This creates a watered steel look that is both honoring Middle Eastern history as well as staying true to the Gerudo's love of intricately designed armor. This cone will have a hole on top for the Gerudo to pull their hair through. Then, we are adding in our Desert Bros to symbolize that these are in fact very established and trained warriors. I added the petal designs and a ruby in the middle. Most of the Gerudo warriors wear a cloth mask over their mouths, which we'll be keeping but changing slightly. We'll be switching out the colorful fabric for that of chainmail to better match historic Arabic designs as well as keep our warriors safer. The torso will be replaced with a crop short sleeve reinforced chainmail that will be worn underneath their armor bralette from Breath of the Wild. Reinforced chainmail was a very popular armor during the Ottoman, Persian, and Turkish empires. Their armor consisted mostly of chainmail, but had larger plates of tempered steel welded into it. This style of armor was lighter than traditional armor plates, helping to keep warriors more agile and to help them beat the heat while fighting in the hot sun. This type of armor is perfect for our fighting style of the Gerudo, as well as adding just a bit more protection to their very exposed torsos. I'm never a fan of bra armor for women in video games, as it makes zero logical sense, but I'm not here to break the wheel at Nintendo. Since the Gerudo haven't covered up their midriff since when they first appeared in 1998, they ain't gonna start now in 2023. Hence why I kept a crop style for the chainmail, but I am trying to get away with a few extra inches of protection. I mean, come on, Nintendo. They're elite warriors for fun's oh! sake. Onto the lower half of their bodies. The Gerudo people are often wearing both skirts and trousers, with the warriors seemingly preferring to wear pants, but wartime has forced them to go back to their roots. Hindu soldiers and Turkish warriors were big believers in the skirt armor for its mobility and ease. In fact, warriors didn't even really consider pants for fighting until the domestication of horses. As I mentioned before, the Gerudo were based on the Amazon women. The ancient Greek wrote about these Amazon warriors, who historians believed were the Scythian warrior women of Eurasian steppe. Archaeologists studying the Scythian burial sites found many women buried with their weapons, dressed in long hiked up skirts. 
I want to mix this fascinating history with the ancient Egyptian armor. Although the Egyptians didn't wear much armor, they did wear linen kilts with a reverse tear fiber cod plate. Tears of the king. The Gerudo women will pull from both of these to have a skirt made of fine Gerudo cloth and a metal shield hanging down in the middle. One way we can take this historical garb and make it more Gerudo is with the desert rose motif. Rather than a fiberglass tear shape, tears of the king. I'd like to have it shaped like an elongated desert rose. All that's left is protecting our warrior's extremities. For the arms, we'll add short van braces, which the Turkish warriors and our Gerudo soldiers from Breath of the Wild already sport. Since our warriors are just wearing a skirt and shield, we'll also be adding some grease for their shins. This is still historically accurate with the sources we pulled, as well as something the Gerudo already wear. I imagine some of their armor and skirts will be slightly torn and scuffed to help demonstrate the hard times that have befallen them. I believe most of their weapons will stay fundamentally the same, since the Gerudos are NPCs and not enemies whose weapons and playstyles need to change in order to keep the gameplay fresh. With the cost of wars apparent to the Gerudo warrior, we saw the civilians on the home front doing their best to survive. My idea is that the Gerudo will be going through a moderate period, rationing many of their goods and wealth. Think of the many Western World War II posters and lessons being taught in the 1940s. Having been usurped from their homes, they would be doing everything they could to get it back, and the home front is just as essential in that battle. The everyday Gerudo was decked out in jewels and gold in Breath of the Wild. It would be a much more interesting method of storytelling to tone down this extravagance in Tears of the Kingdom. These accessories could be sold or melted down for armor and weapons for the war front. We'll also replace their intricate golden belts with a much more modest tied waist cloth. A skirt or trousers could be perfectly appropriate for the Gerudo civilian, but in this case, we'll depict the pants. Their hair in Breath of the Wild was often tied up, held with intricate gold jewelry. Not only do they no longer have that jewelry, they're also dealing with the direct exposure of the sun at all times. Their homes in Gerudo Town are gone, and they don't have the reprieve of a shadowy shelter, nor do they have the cool water aqueducts readily available. Much like our Yiga soldiers, I'd like to give the Gerudo a headscarf to help beat the heat. At the end of the Terrytown side quest, we see Ronson in what seems to be a traditional formal attire for the Gerudo. I'd like to use this headdress, which both holds up her hair and helps protect her head and shoulders, in our new design. The color and pattern, just like all the other fabrics the Gerudo use, would be personal and custom to each individual. That completes our two designs for our Gerudo people. So let's get into their secret weapon. Sand seal surfing is one of the more fun methods of transportation in Breath of the Wild, and it's just about the only way to explore the desert in general. But it's a bit rudimentary and not really born for the war front. Physics-wise, the shield offers more drag to the sand seal's speed. I imagine the towering six and a half foot muscular Gerudo aren't easy for these little sandy mammals to pull around. We need speed and precision if we are going to beat these armored Malduga and the empowered Yiga. I'm suggesting that we once again pull from the ancient Egyptians and include sand sealed chariots in Tears of the Kingdom. The Egyptians used horse-powered chariots, which greatly improved their fighting even in the harsh desert. I would suggest a similar design for our Gerudo, but with their many bright colors, Gerudo patterns, and gold trimming. I of course want to include more desert rose symbolism by adding a magnified petal pattern and a flower amulet to the front. These chariots would attach to the sand seals, who also have a bit of protection against war. Something light that won't add too much traction while swimming through the sand, such as reinforced chainmail our Gerudo warriors are also wearing. Here, we mix some more elements of Turkish armor history, carefully creating a blend of cultures for our ambiguous eastern race of warrior women. Hopefully, with the lack of traction and the sand seal's inherent size difference, the Gerudo will be able to outpace the giant armored Molduga patrolling their home. Now that we have the character designs fleshed out, let's talk about the environmental changes the player would experience. As I said, my main theory driving a lot of these changes is that Gerudo Town is being taken over by the Yiga tribe. I mentioned earlier that they might be able to do this with the armored Molduga and the new bomb technology. The Gerudo Town walls will be penetrated possibly by the metal spikes on the Molduga. I imagine a giant hole where the shrine used to be now guarded by Yika soldiers. There would also be soldiers set up around the other entrances. 
Yiga Grenadiers would be stationed at tall points throughout the town, their bombs leaving harsh damage to the delicate craftsmanship of the Gerudu. Littered around the once impenetrable structure would be tents, crates, and other siege remnants, including Yiga foot soldiers and blade masters patrolling the area with lanterns. Scaffolding and spiky barriers are built throughout the houses, changing how we would normally enter and explore Gerudu Town. One structure in the Zelda series I'd love to see brought back for our scenario is the Wind Waker Light Towers. Our hero would be tasked with breaking into the once great Gerudu Town and possibly killing its new leader. I imagine the side quest taking place at night, and Link has to not only sneak past the countless Yiga with lanterns patrolling, but also the giant light towers that are required to be dismantled in order for you to advance. A sneak mission in video games is always a nice change of pace for the storyline, and to see Gerudo Town in a decommissioned state with barriers, boxes, lighthouses, and of course, bananas everywhere would allow us players to experience it new again. This could be interesting as a mechanic late game, allowing us to unlock interesting interesting Gerudo gear once the town is saved, or even having side quests to repair the once glorious town. Just a quick side note, while editing this video, we got supposed leaks of box art for Tears of the Kingdom edition of the OLED Switch, as well as the game rating. Everything seems to be the same except for the term use of alcohol. The only location in Breath of the Wild that shows alcohol is the tavern in Gerudo Town, which strengthens the theory that the Gerudo shops and entertainment have been decommissioned. One small detail, but I think it's important to the Tears of the Kingdom storyline, is the Gerudo people symbol being covered up by the Yiga cloth. In the Yiga hideout, we see them do this over many of the Gerudo statues and old architecture. It helps make the gravity of the situation very apparent and serious in tone. Let's move on and address the next location, experiencing transformation. Now, we know that the Gerudo had to retreat. Riju loves and cares about her people more than anything, but doubts her own abilities as a leader. She even expresses this concern in her diary and how she can tell her citizens are skeptical due to her immaturity. Riju, faced with an armored Mulduga and revitalized Yiga clan barreling down her door, decides to abandon their home in order to save her people's lives. From there, they flee with their sand seals and, of course, Patricia to the Karakara Bazaar far enough to gain some safety, but remaining in their natural terrain in which they are comfortable, as well as having access to a large trading hub in the area. The bazaar also has somewhat of a barrier, like Gerudo Town, with natural stone walls encompassing some of the location. Tents will be set up in the bazaar for citizens and warriors alike. There will be a trading post set up like in the original game, but maybe the goods will change depending on where you are in the storyline. A makeshift tent for the chief and her trusted advisors will be prominent and guarded with a fence set up nearby for their sand seals. Over in the corner, I imagine a smithing tent and forge. This could be a spot where Gerudu can repair and get armor and weapons for battles. It is possible that this could also be a store for the player to purchase armor and weapons. I'm personally hoping we'll see weapon crafting in Tears of the Kingdom. It was always such a pain to break your favorite weapon. If this is the case, forges like this could be a spot to repair your weapons or even make them stronger like we could with armor and the Great Fairies. There is only one permanent structure at the Car Car Bazaar in Breath of the Wild, which is the inn. At first, I imagine this is where Riju would stay, but I realized with Riju's love for her people, she would of course prefer it to be a makeshift infirmary. It is common during wartime for prominent structures to be adapted into a hospital. This could still, gameplay-wise, act as a resting and healing spot for Link. Story-wise, it would be treating the many wounds dealt to the Gerudo warriors. The whole bazaar will feel a little desolate and depressing, much like how in my previous theory the Gorons will be malice-infected shells of who they once were. The kingdoms will be weeping in this game, and the Gerudo are not exempt. So there are concepts, from the Yiga clan gaining more weapons and soldiers, becoming strong enough with the help of armored Mulduga and Grenadiers to take over the once great Gerudo town, to the disheveled, proud people of the Gerudo doing everything they can to get their home back from the precarious safety of Karakar Bazaar, reforging their weapons and riding sand sealed chariots into battle. I'm going to get into our final illustration in just a second, but I'd love to know your thoughts on my theories and designs. Which one was your favorite? For me, it's definitely the Grenadier, but I want to know your thoughts. What part do you disagree with? Let me know in the comments down below. 
If you're wondering why these videos take me so long, it's probably because I'm a perfectionist and it's not my first time attempting to draw this final piece. Here's my original one, and at the end of a 20 plus hours, I decided I hated it. This new one turned out a lot better, so this is just a PSA to all my fellow artists. Don't be afraid to stop, rethink, redraw, and refine. In fact, you'll see me do that a couple more times during this final work as well. Getting into the drawing, I'm thinking about the main aspects I want to highlight from my concept drawings into the final illustration. For the setting, I chose right outside of Gerudo Town. I'm positioning the Yiga on the right hand side to show that they are the defensive party. I'm imagining the Gerudo are charging into the town from Karakara Bazaar. Maybe you've taken out the light towers and the Gerudo are taking that signal to attempt to take back their home. As day breaks in the horizon, Link faces off against the new Yiga clan member in the town square. In the foreground, we've got a Gerudo warrior clad in reinforced chainmail, a Damascus gold helmet, and traditional Gerudo garb. She is wielding a Gerudo spear, about to cross swords with a Yiga foot soldier. I chose to depict the foot soldier rather than the grenadier since the bomb style fighting isn't made for close combat. The blade masters would also have been a fine choice, but the fighting style and redesign didn't have as much of a transformation as the foot soldier. The nunchucks would be incredibly different to fight again, so that's what I wanted to emphasize. I also want to point out that the change in weapons makes them a more equal match to the Gerudo. The sickle and cleaver from Breath of the Wild aren't the best option against the Gerudo combat, as they are more meant for assassination. Both the new Wind Daisho and the nunchucks are better to defend and attack an opponent who has increased range granted by a spear. I also want to highlight the Grenadier and Watchtowers. The Grenadiers are much more suited fighting from a distance, so I place one on the Gerudo Town walls and another on the Watchtower. Their silhouettes are the smallest in the piece, so I wanted to bring attention to the Grenadier by contrasting their bodies against the light value sky in the background. I also want to stress the Grenadier and their new Malice Bombs by planting a few explosions all over the landscape. Rather than a fiery color, I've made the dust cloud imbued with a magenta hue. Smoke is billowing off the explosions, leaving malice sludge in its wake. Finishing up this drawing, I'm adding in some boxes and trampled Yiga tents from my concept art. And here's the final image. I'd once again love to know your thoughts. I'll be working on the Zora and Rito in the coming weeks, so I hope you look forward to that. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already and sending this to a friend. I'm a very small channel and I'm learning a lot as I go. Oh, and let me know if you like this format better with the added character sheets and details. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.